let's say an artist blows up and has, you know, a song on the radio or a song that goes viral or whatever. One of the good things is being able to say, okay, I'm going to go to this label. I'm going to see what they have to say. I'm going to go to this label. I may try to do something with this company, Apple Music, directly, however it goes. But it's good that you have those options. You know what I mean? If these people start getting together and making these major corporations, it's kind of like, will I really benefit the artist or will I harm the artist? Because now they don't, they can't use their leverage to actually play these labels against each other or whatever the situation may be, you know? Sounds messy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, geniuses? Welcome back to For The Record, and I'm your host, Rob Markman. Now, today's show is a very important one. As much as we talk about the creation of music to artists, about how music is made and how it gets delivered to us, the music business is really just as important. Now, last week, I was pretty shocked, man. I read a Business Insider article which revealed that musicians only get 12% of the $43 billion the music generated in 2017. I reacted crazy. I saw a lot of re artists react crazy. A lot of industry people react crazy. And so I decided to bring a panel here to discuss this, all right? First up, we have John Lynch. He actually wrote the article for Business Insider, which was based on the City Group. He's the entertainment editor over at Business Insider. John, welcome to For The Record. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Now, next up, we have an entertainment attorney. She is one of the stars of the We TV show, Money, Power, Respect. Actually. The only reason that I watch Money, Power, Respect is to see Tiffany Ballard. <laughs> Tiffany, man, what's up? Hi, thanks for having me. No, thank you. And then one of my favorite MCs from Brooklyn, maybe I'm a little biased, but he just released his new album called Crown Fried. Sitting right next to me is my man Dom a Dozen. Dom, welcome to Genius for the Record. Respect. Thank you for having me. Nah, man, thank you for coming. You know, I wanted to, to get, because everybody has different expertise. John, you know, you work at Business Insider. You really kind of synthesized the city group report that blew this up and made it look viral tiffany you represent so many artists producers and songwriters that work with big artists like beyonce and drake and kendrick lamar so you're in here crafting these deals and fighting for your artists to get their fair share and dom you're just out here on your independent grind and hustle you're actually a musician you live you don't have a nine to five this is not a side hustle for you music is what you do so i wanted to get all these three perspectives john i want to start with you um just the article that you wrote for business insider can you give us a summary of, of what it was about yeah so i read this uh city group report you're talking about and i was like taken aback to see as you said 12 percent uh, was what artists were making of this $43 billion that the music industry was uh, generating in total. And um, basically, that 12% is, like, up from, you know, past years, but it's mostly due to touring. So artists are nowadays mostly making their money off of touring as opposed to uh, purchase music, which is, like, down quite a bit, and uh, streaming. Right. It's like, like, what yeah, we're being told big. every time you look around that, you know, Drake is breaking streaming records, you know, um, Bruno Taylor Swift is like keeping her thing off streaming, really selling real well and then going back to streaming. Like, but we, we keep getting these stories that in the streaming era, it's really a, a good time. They brought the money back to music and which is cool. But it's like, Tiffany, where does the money go? <laughs> like, <laughs> I just do you well, on the spot. Right, right, right. Well, um. I wonder too. No, I'm kidding. Um, a part of it, I would say, there are multiple people and entities that have, you know, their hands in the pot. You have to pay a personal manager, you know, business managers. Um, you have labels, you have publishers, you have, I mean, accountants, you have attorneys. So I would need to know the exact, I guess, methodology behind, you know, I, I don't know enough of what went into, I mean, even... When I think about artists, I mean, I don't even, the, I think from what I read in the article, they're talking about performing artists. But, you know, all performing artists don't write their music. So sometimes some of that income may go to songwriters. They may go to producers. I'm not really sure exactly what all went into the article and the, the data that they used. But there are a lot of hands in the pot before the artist get pays out, gets paid out. I mean, makeup artists, barbers. There's a lot. Drivers. And operating costs. The labels have operating costs. Mm -hmm. The streaming services, the retailers, the DSPs all have operating costs mm -hmm. that have to get recouped before any creators get to see a dime. Um, John, just going back to you, was it clear to you within that Citigroup um, report 
you know, it said musicians received 12% of $43 billion. Was that all musicians? Were this just recording artists like your Beyonce, your Bruno Mars, and not necessarily the songwriters, producers, and session musicians who, who play on the album? It, did, it seemed to me like it was all-encompassing. Like, it was like, yeah, any, uh, I think producers were included in it, too. Um, but, yeah, that's one of the things that I know this article, kind of the Citigroup report, kind of got criticized for, like, overgeneralizing a bit. So I'd be interested to, like, really hear what that 12% uh, was a part of, you know, like who who is getting that money necessarily? Right, and, and we're going to get into that too because Billboard just recently um, published an article, kind of as a a rebuttal to the Citigroup report and 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 the headlines that are out there. I know the RIAA is is asking people to look at it differently. But um, Dom, man, I want to get to you because I, you know, I think you know one thing, and, and Business Insider, you guys use, and we understand this, use the uh, image of Kanye West. Yeah. as as the, the thumbnail image, as the lead image for this. And, you know, um, with all due respect, Kanye is going to be fine. <laughs> you know, financially, Kanye, your Beyonce's of the world, your Bruno Mars's, your Jay-Z's, these artists aren't starving at all. Um, Dom, I, I just wanted to talk to you because you're an indie artist from Brooklyn. You just released your album, Crown Fried. Crown Fried, not serving. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and I just wanted to know, first of all, is, is music... For me, for example, I work here at Genius, and then I released an album, which mm -hmm. Tiffany helped me, um, you know, construct the contracts for and get my legal thing. So, you know, music is kind of my my side thing, and I still got to maintain the nine to five. Mm -hmm. Music is all you do. Music is, is, is the only way that you work, the only way that you eat, the only way that you get fed, correct? Yeah. I mean, I'm an artist first, artist, you know, MC. That's my passion, but at the same time, like you said, you know, Living a life, you gotta you gotta live, but you know that kind of like forced me into not forced me. I I enjoy like you know doing jingles. I did something for Domino's like jingles and you know other songwriting opportunities and things like that. So like when I first saw like the article, I thought like twelve percent. Like damn, like what would like Cool Herc or uh, like these guys from like back in the day like think about this? Because it's like. And then, like, knowing the fact that it's all because of, like, the bulk of what the artists are, what they're general, generalizing uh, that 12% to be, artists, producers, the the fact that it's touring just shows that this is, like, a, a, a change in time, you know? Like, the digital age is, like, you know, it's more about, like, the connection to the artists and the fans besides, like, this big everybody hands in the pot type, hey, uh, you know, we need teams, but at the same time, it's like, I feel like the consumption is different nowadays because it's like, you know, we're directly connected to the people that want to, you know, hear us. Go ahead, yeah, yeah. Um, a couple of points. I know in the article it mentioned, though, that which I thought was interesting, that the 12% is actually an increase, and back in 2000, it was actually about 7%. 7%, yeah. And I know they did say it was from touring, but mostly from touring or because now they tour. But I didn't understand it fully only because now there's also 360 deals which didn't exist back in the day. So now they're actually participating in touring income where they would not have in the past, they being labels. Labels, yeah. So I'm a little bit confused as to why not, because artists have always toured. I mean, we go back to, I don't say back to Mariah because she's still relevant, but Whitney, you know, so many people, Michael Jackson, when didn't they tour? So I don't know why they would say that now it's increased because of toys, especially when now labels eat off of tour income too, whereas they didn't in the past. It was mostly sales. So I've been, yeah, I they were saying like they were saying that the tour, like artists are touring more to to get like more revenue and uh, just that the growth of like tours is skyrocketed. I was looking at this graph and it was like past five years or so. It was like a lot of money. Well, well you know, increase, it goes but... back to this thing. I think there's like these general reports, right? There's always these, and I hate these articles. Millennials kill Applebee's. <laughs> Millennials kill. <Yeah. laughs> but but one of the things that's important to this generation that that it seems through the reports is experiences, right? Like like this generation much rather pay for experiences. So while we technically aren't paying for music, if if you're streaming, you're paying for the access to listen to music, but you're not paying to own music. That it seems that fans are willing to go out more and and and, and pay a little more for a concert ticket. You know, Drake and the Migos will be coming to New York in a couple of weeks, and I, I think they got about six or seven dates. I think like four dates in MSG alone, like, you know, those are running into, like, Billy Joel numbers and, and things that we used to see from these touring giants. Um, Tiffany, I want to I go um, back to you because, 
a lot of um, the clients that you represent are songwriters and producers, um, musicians who can't tour, who, who, who aren't able to make any of this touring revenue that, you know, this touring boom that we so hear of. How, how do you navigate that with your clients? How, how, how do you make sure that they get their fair share? One thing I try to do is because, how do I go without being so technical? Okay, so in terms of producers, let's say, right? You have these things that are called producer decks where you sign, you say, okay, you can use my song, I'll get half now, and the other half of the advance later, but we'll work out the technicalities later. One thing I try to do is say, okay, let's not do a deck and let's go straight to the long form agreement. That way you have leverage because once you sign this deck, we can argue back and forth about points all day long about what the splits are going to be, you know, who's going to actually, you know, how the sample is going to be allocated, whether or not the artist is going to actually, you know, whatever it is. So um, one of the things I try to do is to go past the producer deck aspect and go straight to a long form that we, we can agree that, you know, negotiate the actual points. But a lot of it is leverage. I mean, it's what was your last hot track? Who have you worked with? You know, this art, this client is not going to take, he's not willing to take this percentage because X, Y, Z. He got this percentage on a different deal with, you know, an artist who's much bigger than the artist that you're talking about right now. So why would he be willing to take just 10% from you when he got 50% from a Grammy winning artist? You know what I mean? So um, really it's just looking at the facts, looking at the leverage and actually being willing to, to go, you know, to forego the producer deck, which gives you more leverage and to just stick it through and just... Right. Negotiate up front is, is what you're saying, like just sign it out up front. No, I'm saying don't upset. sign, don't do the deck, don't okay. do the upfront. Um, because some people need that, you know, that first half of the advance, right? Forego that first half of the advance and get the entire advance. Um, once the long form is done, because then you still have the leverage. They can't put that song on that album until you finish that long form. Whereas if you sign the producer deck, they can use that song on that album and you guys can fight for the next year about the second half of your advance and what the terms are going to be of the composition. Why, why do that? It sounds messy. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, John, I want to get with you because um, the Citigroup report has, and we mentioned it a little bit, faced criticism. I, I know um, Billboard wrote a couple of articles, the RIAA. Um, people are questioning how do they get to this accounting? How do you get to this number? And that they may not be looking at things the right way because essentially they're an investment firm and may not have the expertise of the ins and outs of the music industry. What, what's your take on all that? Yeah, I was, they had like a couple like bullet points of things that they took issue with in it. And it was, they one thing was like um, the Citigroup report was saying that a lot of like consolidation in the industry could help young artists or like up and coming artists. And they took issue with that saying that um, Sirius XM, for example, like gets like, They've got crazy profits, but it's not necessarily going down to the artists. So uh, consolidating of like if Spotify, as the Citigroup was saying, if Spotify started to like be act as like a music label for emerging artists, it might not necessarily be good for those artists because who's to say that the profits will go on to the musicians? Uh, there were a couple other things like they took issue with like just numbers, like overgeneralizing too. No, yeah, it's interesting because when you get with the... and. and, and you know, Tiffany, maybe you can speak to this, the consolidations of, of like, um, you know, streaming services, you know, like partnering with Live Nation and, and, and kind of, then you get to the point of this almost like a 360 situation where it's like every aspect of where artists eats forms under one umbrella. Mm -hmm. And I mean, can artists truly benefit from that? Some, some may say that the leverage of this consolidation will allow more money to come in through the marketplace because you have a more powerful entity negotiating on your behalf. But in reality, the is is this really a good thing for artists? Um, see, it's kind of hard to say because theoretically, if you're cutting out the middleman, well, the, the label isn't necessarily the middleman, but if you're cutting the label out, then theoretically, you would think there's more of the pie to split between you know, the Spotify's and the Live Nations and the artists, theoretically, but we know, you know, that doesn't necessarily happen. That's like if you are an employee of a company and the company merges with another conglomerate, does that, with another company to form a conglomerate, does that mean your paycheck is going to change? Not necessarily. They may keep whatever share they were keeping and, and just split it amongst the, you know, the, the partners up top. So it's just, uh, it could go either way. Theoretically, you know, I could see someone arguing that cutting a label out would increase the pie for the artists below. But in reality, I'm just not sure how that would work. Um, and I think even having these conglomerates and like, you know, these merges, I don't think is necessarily a good thing because 
part of you know an, an artist you know getting into the a hot or let's say an artist blows up and has you know a song on the radio or a song that goes viral or whatever. One of the good things is being able to say, okay, I'm going to go to this label. I'm going to see what they have to say. I'm going to go to this label. I may try to do something with this company, Apple Music, directly, however it goes. But it's good that you have those options. You know what I mean? If these people start getting together and making these major corporations, it's kind of like, will I really benefit the artist or will I harm the artist? Because now they don't, they can't use their leverage to actually play these labels against each other or whatever the situation may be, you know? Keyword again, coming up, leverage. Damn, you know... I, w I want to speak to you. Um, I just want to get more insight. If you could paint a, a picture of of what you have to plan for financially, how you handle your business. You, you know, you just put out this album, mm -hmm. and you know that there's costs to create the album before you put it out, and you know you have to plan to recoup and then pay yourself and and somehow profit so you can maintain a living and, and a lifestyle. Um, Outside of the work that goes in the studio, how hands on hands on are you with kind of the business and, and and balancing your own books and making sure that you get to eat and keep the lights on at the end of the day? I mean, uh, as much as this is an ever changing game, the game plan and the uh, the strategy also adjust within that. You know, I, like I said earlier, like it's 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 a changing game. It's like the digital age. You know. Um, a lot of effort goes into like my merch, mm. you know, putting out merch and with that, you know, assisting it with the music, you know, I get, you know, a lot of people dig the Ghetto Olympics, the Crown Fries. So I put out projects with that uh, attached to it and that really helps me navigate. So, so it's like telling a story also, not just through the music, but with the merch that you put out yeah. again, with the experiences that you're able to create, like, you know what, we can't touch an album if you're streaming it, but merch you could touch. You could touch it, you could feel it, you could interact with it in real life. Yeah. And um, yeah, as I go on, like I, I've, I've yet to tour uh, as a solo artist myself, you know, uh, but I, I, I was in a band a few years ago and, you know, through that, like, you know, I learned a lot just, you know, touring with them and, you know, seeing how, you know, you can keep it going with getting on the road and, that's why I can understand that, you know, why touring is so important and why it's the bulk. But I'll look at that too, like, damn, like, the, 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 like 360 and the tourists too. So shit, that's the most we're getting and they got their hands in that too. It's like, sheesh. <laughs> let, let me ask you a question and just for the fans listening, because usually we have artists up here um, talking about, you know, their, their music and, and it's kind of the fandom around the artists. And, and, and we know you have very passionate fans, but... So the people out there, and, and anybody can jump in for the fans, why should the fans care? Like, for them, they're like, man, I, I just want to listen to the artists that I love. I mean, even looking at that article, just that quote, just like, damn, like, I was disappointed as a fan. Right. It's like, people go and they say, hey, like, I'm supporting my favorite artists right now when I'm streaming this or I'm, I'm buying this. And then at the end of the day, it's like, is it like is it going to them like like you said earlier who who's it going to it's like that's a good point that's a, I should, no I'm sorry go ahead. that's a good point because if I was like from purely if I was looking at it purely from a fan standpoint and I thought I was supporting like one of my favorite artists like growing up let's say it was Little Kim or something like that and yeah I was too young to be bumping hardcore but Shout I was to Kim that. we got it oh yeah there you go look right right I was definitely bumping hardcore so here you go uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So let's say, you know, when I was younger, younger Tiffany's bumping Little Kim and I bought Hardcore, but let's say an article came out that said that Little Kim was getting, you know, 12% or whatever, you know, I'm like, well, I'm just going to illegally download it. I'm not support. Why would I? I'm not, I'm not going to do, no, right. I'm going to be upset. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But on the flip side, the incentive, I guess it could also give um, more incentive to fans to go to purchase tickets for tours and to purchase merchandise. So I guess. That's the flip side because I would probably say I might now I might download the music illegally, but I'm gonna go to her concert and I'm gonna buy whatever merchandise she puts out because I want, I know she's making more on that side. So now I want to make sure little Kim is eating off of what it is that I'm buying. You know what I mean? Because you do find that these fan armies are really really invested in the artists. Like you, first of all, you can't tell little Kim fans nothing. <laughs> um, I, I got into it just because I said. I, you know, I like this new Nicki album. I had a couple of little Kim fans in my mentions this weekend. If you say you like Kim, you got the Nicki fans in your mention. You can't tell these fan armies nothing. They will go to hell and back for their favorite artists and to support their favorite artists. Um, John, I wanted to um, pick your brain on um, 
the Music Modernization Act and, and what you knew about that, because that's a bill that's in front of Congress, right, which, you know, they're promising will we'll ensure that the digital music services, all the streamers, will pay fair royalties to the right holders and also give the streaming companies certain leverage and, and legal wiggle room to protect their business so they're not losing out. Um, how can this potentially help the, the music industry? Yeah, it's supposed to, like, streamline that whole process because the music industry is, like, it's working at still the, like, old-school model when we we're selling physical copies and stuff like that. So it's, like, hopefully updating that to boost royalties. And, uh, yeah, um, I know it's, like, it's supposedly passed the House, but it's, like, Congress is a mess, so who knows? If yeah. It'll, like, get to – and the, Trump's got to sign it, too, which I'm kind of dismayed about. <sighs> right? I mean <laughs> – who knows? Come on. It, can, it can help people out. It'll yeah. help, though. Like, they have to put it in Russian if they want to right? sign it. I'm kidding. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Nah, say it with your chest. <laughs> <laughs> you said you got to put it in Russian if they want to sign it. I like that. Um, just closing, you know, remarks. Um, look, the, the truth is um, we wanted to do this episode to, to kind of educate the fans and have... I know fans were a, lot, a lot of fans were upset when they saw this. A lot of artists was upset, the artist community. Um, we just wanted to have the discussion. We don't necessarily have all the answers, but it's really interesting. We consume more music than ever. You know, if you're on YouTube, chances are you're listening to music. You know, if you have Spotify or Apple or Tidal, um, damn near every song created is at your fingertips. We, as, as people, as fans, we're consuming more music than ever, and it's important to understand the business and, and, and where is it going. Um, just closing remarks, things that you think is important, especially for the people to know. Um, down, man. I, I'd start with you. Um, I was just thinking about the MMA and, uh, uh, you know, it's about to be passed. I mean, hopefully. I've been looking into it and it's just like that allows us to receive more from streaming through all the companies, Spotify. In, in, in theory, yeah, that it, it's supposed to, um, there's a lot of paperwork that goes on with who gets the royalties and it, it just really, like John was saying, streamlines the whole process and frees up um, a lot more money or a portion of more money. I don't exactly know how much, but, you know, musicians of, of all kinds, um, artists, recording artists, producers, songwriters, get a bigger split of the pie is what the promise of this, this bill, what this act is. Yeah, I think it's supposed to remove some of the bureaucracy of, like, you know, people have catalogs. They don't want to license stuff or whatever the situation may be, and I believe that it's like an a panel that oversees it that are like publishers and actual music people, you know, mm -hmm. so they supposedly have more, you know, insight and look more. And I actually songwriters, a lot of songwriters are like, yes, let's do it. And a lot of publishers are like, yes, let's do it, which is actually rare because usually the interests are opposed, you know, they have opposing interests. But if you can get pub publishers and songwriters on the same page, it seems like it should be something that they should at least, you know, attempt the creatives, the creatives is at y'all head, man. <laughs> the creatives, we here. It's a new town, man. <laughs> and John, what, what, what should we should look out for in, in, you know, just going forward in the future as this bill is, is about to get passed and a lot of information is coming. I think a lot of sides, like Citigroup is one side and they got their own interests. The RIA has their own interests and you're seeing a lot of kind of back and forth. Like, what's the most important things that we should be looking out for, you think? I think like some of the alternative stuff, like I was talking to Lupe Fiasco earlier this year and uh, he was really like excited about blockchain technology as like this, you know, you can uh, through like raising money through blockchain, it goes right to you. It's like direct. And that's like something that seems super exciting as like a up and coming technology and stuff. And I saw Grammatic is this like DJ from Slovenia. He raised like $2.48 million dollars for his, money, for his music off of that. And I don't know, it's just, that's that's like something that intrigues me, but artists aren't making enough off of streaming. You know, it's like, there's gotta be alternate revenues and avenues to like uh, find that. Right, like writing jingles for dominoes, man. That's a, that's a good hustle. Um, I'd like to thank all of my guests, John, man, oh, yeah. Tiffany, thank you. Dime a dozen, man, Crown Fried is in stores now. Thank yes. you for being the guest today. Thank you for the information. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Go ahead. I just add one thing. Go. You didn't ask about my closing remarks. So, Go ahead. No. Did no, I but, ask him over you? No, I just, I, I, I'm what sorry. happened was I butted in because he was uh, talking about the MMA and so I, I butted in and gave my two cents. But no, what I do want to say is um, I think that something is important, like no matter what, is for artists, 
whether they, I mean, if the aspiration, because all artists don't want to go major, but if an artist knows at some point they want to get in bed with a major, I think to do as much groundwork and as much like hustle as much as possible, because like you mentioned, you know, the, the word leverage, word that they leverage, no matter what, even though it's not going to be, it's just a system, it is a setup how it is, you know, an artist is not going to ever get 100% of their income, you know, generated, not even 50%, but at least if there's a certain amount of leverage going in because you have a song that's viable or you have, you know, fans that are committed to you and you can demonstrate, look, I have people who are checking for me, at least you can get the best terms possible for you, as opposed to going through just with a catalog of music that no one's ever heard. It may be good to the A&R guy that's going to sign you, but that A&R guy is not going to be able to get the book opened up or get certain things for you. You know, your deal situated a certain way if you can't demonstrate that you're a good, you know, you're worth the investment. You know what I mean? So I think it's important for people to put in the groundwork. Like if they need a nine to five, they got to work at McDonald's in order to pay for studio time, to pay for some decent quality mixing and mastering, whatever it is. I think it's important for people to invest in, you know, their product before they even try to make that step and go to pursue a major label job. No, that's a good word. Thank you. And, and, you know, I know we got a lot of fans that watch this show that are actually musicians or aspiring musicians in the comment. They're commenting all the time. So hopefully you guys got a jewel out of this for real. But again, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. This was a very different episode of For the Record, but an important one, man. So I hope you guys learned something.